such an honor to be able to talk to you. I know how busy you are. And uh -huh. I love, I'd love i love to hear how you see, yeah, how you see the way forward after this COVID crisis. I think the most important thing we learned from the crisis is that when you're in a really critical situation and you're feeling uncertain and anxious, the people that support you best are in fact your neighbours. And lots of people in my community are finding that they've got to know people they didn't know before and they're setting up WhatsApp groups and really getting to know each other, talking over the fence. I mean, I've got to know my neighbours so much better during this time, which has been really nice. And you know, people that were used to just hopping into a car and driving to the supermarket, they really started to ask questions about what those systems are really like and what's behind them. Things they'd completely taken for granted, you know, really failed in various ways. And instead, we've had community shops that are delivering to people who've been unwell. And we've had pubs, lots of pubs here, turning themselves into community shops and delivering food. And it's really been the very, very local businesses that have come to the aid of, of people in their communities and I I think people have well certainly they've appreciated that and I hope they'll find that special local connection and you know the ability to have those personal relationships much more valuable than going back to the, the supermarkets. Could you also say something about your political uh, take back of democracy in, in Stroud? I think in a place like Stroud, we already had a lot of systems in place because we started Transition Stroud back in 2007 and we'd already been building up these systems of resilience because we were anticipating a climate crisis. And we've got a lot of local supply chains here. So, for example, my vegetables come from the local community supported agriculture, which is where I go for my daily walk. A mile away, they grow my vegetables and they deliver them half a mile away to a, a local community centre and you know, I only have to go that far to get locally grown vegetables. I don't need any other vegetables. So it's completely resilient. Nothing needed to change. Like they just need to use more hand sanitizer. You know, everything else has, has worked. And we also have a, a food scheme here, a local food delivery called Stroud Co., which actually wasn't functioning at the beginning of the crisis. But in the first month, lots of people volunteered and got that working. So you can buy from local producers here, but we also have a delivery from a whole food cooperative and then they deliver food to my door and I get deliveries from farm shops, locally grown meat and eggs and cheese. So everything comes to me locally and I don't have to go outside my front door. So in a place like Stroud, I feel we already had very good systems and maybe what we need to do is develop those systems better for cities and really start to think about how we can have more food growing certainly in the green belt around the cities and also production of energy. So we're not wasting so much energy in these long supply chains. Have you been hearing uh, certain propaganda from big industry that the supply lines and the long distances in terms of energy transmission have been improved and that is not an issue? Have you been hearing that? Because it's certainly well, something I'm trying to promote is the awareness that we need to decentralize the grid. You know, yeah. it doesn't need to be down to the tiny village level, but, you know, yeah. we need it at the regional level. So we have some idea of what's going in, who's in charge, yeah. of it, how much is going in and how much is going out and for what. Well, I think in Britain, certainly our energy system was set up after the Second World War when everything was about central command and control. Not very many things have survived in those days, but the, the electricity grid certainly has. And it's always been the case that there's been a loss of um, energy and transmissions, which we really can't afford these days. And I, I do think local grids are an important part of this and local distribution centres. And as we move towards a grid that's more about flexibly responding to demand and also about storage of energy, I think we're all going to be storing energy in our homes and we're going to have a much more, a much more uh, relationship of much more understanding about where our energy comes from and how we can change the way we live to use less energy. And that does mean a local connection to your energy supply, certainly. We learned this where I live back in, uh, I think it was 2007, we had a really serious flood. And we were like this close to our electricity substation being knocked out completely. And I never had any idea previously where my electricity came from. And we did lose water supply. So in a way, these crises, they teach you important lessons about the vulnerability of your supply. And you do learn to improve your resilience. And that's what I think we need to learn 
from this COVID crisis that the closer it is to home, the more resilient it is. Almost everyone seems to have realized how fragile and unsustainable and unreliable the global supply chains are. And there seems to be even at the top level now recognition that we need to decentralize. I think there has been a lot of recognition by elites, you know, by political people that the system they were relying on was not as secure as they thought. And we've only really started down that road because food supply chains are, you know, going to be affected during the coming year and food prices and we'll see volatility in, in food prices, I'm sure, this year coming. So I think a lot of people are starting to realise that just giving responsibility to a few corporations for everything has left us all very vulnerable. And the question is, how do we take that forward? Because obviously the corporations already have power in those political parties and are often making donations to political parties. So I think we really need to raise questions about the power of corporations. Some things they do very effectively, they need to be regulated and we need to build much more resilient local systems. I mean, we've got a good example here where our food and farming minister was appearing at the daily press briefings and really didn't seem to have any idea of what the food distribution system was and was just sort of saying oh you know this supermarket Sainsbury's or Tesco they will sort it out you know he was he had completely disempowered himself and just signed everything over to these massive corporations with their hugely unsustainable business models their waste of energy and their waste of a lot of food as well and one thing we have learned is we absolutely can't afford to waste food and that supermarket model where maybe as much as half our perfectly good food is thrown away. You know, we have to, we have to end that. We learn that from the COVID crisis, but it's even more important in terms of the climate crisis. What I find is very often when I try to encourage people, you know, we try to encourage a two pronged approach, <clears throat> join, support, help to start new local initiatives with a big focus on food, but also energy, business alliances, even in terms of education, every level. But we are also saying, please, please also let your voice be heard so that we can change what I'm calling, you know, the key mechanisms whereby governments shape the economic direction, the subsidies, the taxes, and the regulation. Whenever I talk about that political side, people are always imagining that we need to go and lobby our national government. I'm saying no. I'm talking about what I call big picture activism. I'm trying to say, no, let's talk to each other about policy. Because just like your dear minister there who didn't even know about the food supply chains and who's actually in control, we've all just handed over this power and we need to become more economically literate in order to be more politically literate. Mm. What would you say about that? Well, I see both sides of that because here in Stroud, we've got a lot of activism, we've got a lot of community engagement, we have the farm, as I already said, you know, we are really thinking about protecting ourselves and protecting our own supplies. And we've got a very strong community to do that. But I also think that you're always swimming upstream if you have a government that's effectively in the pocket of corporations and doesn't recognise the importance of relocalising our economy. So, um, you know, that's why I've always been political. I've always worked at both levels. And I would say that, that the Greens, this has been part of our repertoire from the very beginning. Well, as you know, from the very founding of the Green Party, local economies, strong communities, and really challenging those global supply chains is something that, that we have always stood by. And I worked on a, a trade policy as part of the European Greens that really was focused on this idea of trade subsidiarity. So beginning with the local, whatever it is you need, look to the local first and then only move further afield if you can't get it in your local economy. And we really need to have governments that start to recognise that that's how their trade policy should be focused rather than this obsession with always going further afield, um, which is wasteful of energy and reduces security. So I think we need both those things. We, we can do a lot in our local communities um, but we do need supportive government action as well. And I think rather than lobbying politicians, people should become those politicians because it's often people like ourselves who have all these ideas. You know, we, we often don't have the confidence to do that, but I would encourage everybody to, you know, if you're not satisfied with the politicians, become the politician because that's the way that democracy can flourish. 
I also find, you know, in trying to raise awareness about the economic dimension in particular, that there are so many people, even highly educated, prominent men, and, you know, who feel, oh, no, no, I'm not an economist. So, you know, I can't think about it. I can't. So this is where I, I feel we really have to insist that, no, this is actually fundamentally about our survival, it's about the environment, it's about our jobs, it's about our identities, and it is about democracy. And so we need to become more eco-literate, you know, I'm yeah. saying economically as well as ecologically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Every, yeah. Everybody, everybody has a right to speak about economics. Economics is not something that should be limited into that sphere of maths and highly technical discussion. The whole purpose of doing that was to eliminate the rest of us from those really important discussions. And we just have to reject that. You know, I speak as a professor of economics, but people tell me I'm not an economist because I don't agree with that sort of globalizing technocratic view of how the economy should work. But there's no other study where people say, unless you have this view, you're not an economist. You know, you're an economist. We all know lots of people who are green economists or ecological economists who absolutely agree with what we're saying about the need to rebuild local economies. And everybody is an economist. Everybody has to run a household. Everybody has to make decisions about where they do their purchasing. The economy is for everybody and everybody has a right to feel empowered about deciding how our economy should work. So brilliant, Molly. You're so articulate <laughs> and so clear. And it's been so fabulous to hear you on the radio. I haven't actually recently heard you. I just remember during the whole Brexit thing, when you were there sometimes. Have you been on also during COVID? They, they don't give me any space now because I'm not an MEP. It's very frustrating. Oh, really? Mm. And the Greens, because we lost seven MPs, we've now been sort of cut out. We only have Caroline now. It's really harsh. I did do some work on COVID around the local community shield, but you know, I had to give it to Caroline basically. I'm, I'm launching something this week about degrowth which is about finance, so it is my bag. We'll see. But their decision is if you don't have political power, you can't speak. And because of our electoral system, they can keep us out of power, so they can effectively silence the green voice in Britain. Yeah. Very yeah. infuriating, really. To, to just come back to this um, need to build up that political momentum so that we actually do take back the power to insist that we need regulations that actually yeah. bring in deregulated finance, deregulated yeah. global players. Mm -hmm. and to do that, what do you see as the main avenues and, and ways of communicating? We've got populists in power now. You can clearly see that the countries that have populists in power are the ones that are failing to deal with the COVID crisis. Obviously in Britain, in the US, in Brazil, and in Russia, the four countries that are dealing with it the least well, I would say, and where we'll have the most deaths. So it's a really good proof of why you shouldn't vote for populists, and they basically don't give a damn about the people who vote for them. They use propaganda and manipulation to win elections, and then they proceed down their own course for their own interests, rewarding the people who funded the parties, corporate interests, and so on, and rewarding themselves. We're going to see very clear evidence of that in terms of lives lost. And then I think we have to really, you know, make that, ram that message home. This is what populists do to you. They have no interest in you. They use your vote at elections and then they just cast you aside. And, you know, the alternative to that is much more engaged democracies. And we are also in a way seeing that. We're seeing people being angry, coming out onto the streets. Um, and... You know, I think what we have to try to do as people who've been in this game for a while is to mobilize that energy and send it in useful directions. Because what we need is much more democracy at all levels. And so devolution to the local level is so important in Britain. We've had a, a response to COVID that's been organized through centralized, privatized new systems when we had perfectly good public health systems in our local authorities that were just ignored and underfunded. And the result has been complete chaos and failure. So, you know, I think the question of where power sits and who is exercising it is fundamental. And we'll be able to see when we've, you know, got further through this crisis. And we can see already, in fact, that where power is centralised and not, um, we don't have a flourishing democracy, really lives are at stake here. And if that's true of COVID, it's equally true, or if not more true, of the climate crisis. So we need to see this, I think, as a sort of exercise 
in which systems work well. And what we've learned is systems with a lot of women involved have worked well, systems where people are engaged have worked well, and systems where democracy is very strong have worked well. And those are exactly the things we need to enhance for dealing with the climate crisis. So in Britain, we had very good public health systems. In fact, you know, some of the best systems in the world. And in 2012, they were basically diminished. And since then, we've had cuts and they've been really underfunded. So when this um, health crisis came along, what would normally have dealt with that, the public health systems, were in fact sidelined. And instead, the government set up parallel systems for testing, for contact tracing, and for PPE, and those systems have miserably failed. They've been organized by private corporations who didn't have the experience they needed, who've just employed people on minimum wage with minimal training, and they're just not up to the job. And they did that for purely ideological reasons because we had the public health experts there, and all they needed was to fund those systems better at local level, bring in more staff at local level, and we could have had a perfectly good um, contact tracing system now, and we could be leaving our homes in confidence, whereas, in reality, the British response, everything has failed. And now the contact tracing is failing as well. And that's mainly because it's run by Serco. You know, it's run by a private company who are simply not experienced at doing this work. But we've got a government that would always trust a private corporation rather than public expertise. And that's really why we've ended up in this tragedy of being one of the, the countries with the highest number of deaths even when it comes to health, you know, a decentralized structure where people are more empowered and where there's more. Yeah. And, you know, it's partly also, as you know, that these systems were traditionally and could once again be far more stable and, and provide more secure jobs and more, you know, human scale interdependence where there is more deep knowledge of the specific community and the illnesses. So the decentralization in healthcare is also so important. Yeah. Doesn't mean well, that we move away from any centralized structures. What we've learned from the COVID crisis is that centralized privatized solutions have totally failed people here in the UK. And we can't afford to fail again with the climate crisis. So we have to make sure that we use local knowledge and local expertise and that we fund local authorities properly so that we can build back better, retrofit our homes, electrify our transport systems, build active travel systems and everything we need to deal with the climate crisis. And it has to start here at the local level. Thank you so much, Molly. <laughs> no Thank problem. You. I'm glad you're doing it, Helena. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Look forward to seeing more. Bye.